Uh, hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us. My name is Ali Al Sharif, and I'm a steering committee member at ACE. ACE is a global community of machine learning practitioners and researchers who have gathered around topics of uh, there's a bit of an echo. I'm sorry, I'm going to start over. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Ali Al Sharif, and I'm a steering committee member at ACE. ACE is a global community of machine learning practitioners and researchers who have gathered around topics in AI research, engineering, and products. We have a repository of YouTube videos that showcase authors presenting their research and practitioners demonstrating the use of emerging machine learning methods and tools. Uh, we also host social events where you get a chance to network with fellow community members. Uh, we conduct workshops focused on helping participants take machine learning concepts from foundational theory all the way to fully deployed models. We have multiple streams organized around topics, and this presentation is part of our model interpretability stream. We encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out our website at ai.science. Uh, today, uh, we are hosting Ozan uh, Ozigen. Ozan is a research assistant at Ryerson Data Science Lab and a PhD student at Ryerson University. He holds a master's degree in data science and analytics from Ryerson University and a bachelor in computer engineering from Istanbul Technical University. His aim is to make tech, uh, deep learning methods and models uh, more interpretable. Uh, his main research interests are deep learning, explainable AI, time series forecasting, and natural language processing. Um, in terms of the motivation for the talk, uh, time series is uh, used uh, in various fields, such as stock market analysis, healthcare, earthquake predictions, sales forecasting, and other high-stake predictions. Uh, interpreting time series models has many benefits, including generating transparency, trust, fairness, and improving our understanding of the models. Uh, from a modeling perspective, it also helps us debug our models and make sure that they're uh, behaving correctly. Uh, uh, today, we're going to be having a literature review uh, about time series interpretability. Uh, uh, and uh, it is a very interesting presentation, and I'm looking forward to it. Uh, to the audience, please post your questions in the chat, and we will be asking your questions immediately after the presentation. So without further ado, I will now introduce to you uh, Ozan. Uh, please take it away. OK, thanks, Ali. Um, let me share my screen. OK, can you see the screen? Uh, can you see the screen? Uh, yes, we can see it. Yeah. OK, so today I will talk about explainable AI techniques for time series. So first, I will give you some preliminary information about time series and explainable AI, and then uh, the, this talk is divided into two parts. In the first talk, in the first part, I will talk about post-talk explanations where we um, try to interpret a trained model. Uh, and I will talk about two methods specifically, feature occlusion and SHAP, uh, and how they are applied to time series. And in the second part, I will talk about intrinsically interpretable models, models that are interpretable um, due to some inherent properties. And I will specifically talk about one model named NBeats uh, in more detail. And then uh, if you want to learn more about interpretable AI, explainable AI for time series, I will give you uh, some reading list uh, and then uh, talk, about, talk briefly about some other approaches. And then I will take the questions in the end. So time series are ubiquitous and they occur in many areas, uh, such as like, social sciences, Internet of Things, supply chains, healthcare, and many more. And the traditional time series modeling techniques uh, are usually focused on interpreting a individual time series using a local model. Whereas in the recent years with the uh, deep learning revolution, we has led to a lot of improvements. Now we can utilize, we can train a single global model using a lot of related time series. And then the, sa the single global model can make predictions for uh, all these time series and they can it can utilize uh, multiple time series a large amount of data and in postdoc explanations uh, we have a trained machine learning model and the idea is uh, to perturb the input of this model 
and depending on how the prediction changes uh, and by sometimes looking at the model internals uh, we use a method uh, an approach to come up with an explanation so the simplest way to find uh, the feature importance in uh, time series is to remove that feature and measure the effect of removing that feature so for time series uh, let's say if we have a sample like this where the rows are different features and columns are different time steps uh, so this can be a, a sliding window from the time series and then if let's say we want to uh, find the importance of this feature we can uh, remove that feature and look at how the prediction changes and based on that uh, based on how much the prediction changes we can uh, interpret that as, uh, that as the importance of that feature but uh, here one important uh, argument is about how to re represent the missing features how, how to represent uh, the removed features uh, i won't get into details about that that's uh, like a large discussion on itself but for time series people are using uh, means or uh, they can replace the remote features with the mean values uh, for of that feature or they can add some noise but one of the another uh, like a problem with this approach is it doesn't consider uh, the relationships between different features and for that reason we can use a more complex approach uh, like SHAP uh, SHAP is a very popular uh, lo local interpretability method uh, it's model agnostic and it can compute uh, the contributions of each feature towards the prediction uh, so in this case in this figure for example this is not a time series example but here we, we have different categorical and continuous features and then we can see how each of them are affecting the output and it also considers um, the relationships between the feature features by using the Shapley values but when we try to apply this into time series uh, it can be computationally infeasible because in time series sometimes our inputs can be uh, quite large we can have like thousands of features uh, because we con we had to consider the number of features if you have a sliding window we have multiple time steps and multiple features and uh, in that case removing different combinations of features uh can be quite expensive and for we have a similar problem in for images because if we try to remove each pixel from the image it's um it's, it will take a, a lot so instead uh, the original shop paper proposed to use image patches so we can divide to divide the image into different patches and then instead of uh, removing each combination of pixels from the image we can remove uh, these patches uh, which are called super pixels uh, we can remove different combinations of super pixels uh, which significantly reduces the number of computations we need to make and then we can find the importance of <coughs> each patch and then uh, a similar idea is applied uh, to time series by uh, using time windows so instead of removing each uh, time step we can remove different time windows and then we can compute the importance of these time windows and this is useful because it reduces the training time and also in many cases it also improves the interpretability because uh, when we when we instead of seeing the importance of a single time step if we usually when we it's easier to interpret uh, the importance of a time window in most cases and the uh, authors of uh, this paper who applied SHAP for time series they test this on UCR gunpoint data set and in this data set uh, we have a binary classification problem where uh, there are two classes gun draw and point in gun draw uh, the actor uh, draws a gun and then it points they point the actor points the gun and they put it back in the point version they do the same thing just with their hand so it's like a fake gun draw 
and uh, the x-axis of the actor's hand movements are tracked and based on those uh, hand movements uh, the goal is to classify uh, whether it's a gun draw or a point and this is a univariate time series classification problem because we have a single feature and uh, we, tr we are trying to classify between these two features and when the SHAP method is applied uh, on this data set this is what the results look like uh, so this is the explanation of one of the time series from the from this data set and here uh, the red areas show uh, the features contributing the time slices that are contributing to uh, feature class one whereas the blue areas show uh, the uh, time slices contributing to the other feature and we can gain insights by seeing which parts of the time series uh, are effect are contributing to a cl one of which class of the prediction and we can do something similar by using an intrinsically interpretable model so in the previous case we have a trained model and then we use the shap method to explain this method so now i'm moving into the uh, intrinsic interpretability where we have a model uh, and by looking at the uh, weights of the model we can come come up with some interpretable properties and we can do the uh, we can again compute the contributions of the inputs by training a specific intrinsically interpretable model so this our, this model is called uh, retain and it can compute uh, the variable importance uh, by looking at the model weights and they applied uh, this model to healthcare data sets so in this case uh, they they are working on a problem uh, for heart failure pred prediction and in this figure here each column each vertical line represents a, the same patient's visit uh, to the hospital and then uh, at each visit there are some different events that's happening uh, and in the end the patient is diagnosed with heart failure and once we trained uh, this model uh, for with multiple patients then we can uh, observe its weights to understand how uh, each of these events are contributing to the uh, to the di diagnosis or to, to the prediction of the model and here we can see that uh, the, the y-axis show the uh, contribution and we can see that these events like skin disorder or skin lesion doesn't contribute much uh, to the heart failure whereas uh, some these cardiac events are contributing uh, heavily towards the prediction uh, so we can observe these kind of uh, things from the model and this is useful because uh, we can by training this on different types of data sets like we can gain more insights uh, on how the model behaves and we can understand we can learn maybe new things about uh, how a different feature is affecting uh, the prediction something that we haven't thought about and then uh, we can by this way we can also learn from the data so these intrinsically intrinsic interpretable models are explainable due to their interpretable structure so one of the basic examples is decision trees or sparse linear models in those cases for example by looking at the decision rules of a decision tree you can understand how the model behaves uh, so they are explainable uh, by default uh, however it's important to point out that there are different types of interpretability so the one that i showed you is about variable importance or variable contribution but we can also uh, there are very different shades of interpretability. We can look at the model internals. Uh, we can uh, look at specific ways the model behave uh, to come up with interpretable properties uh, from the model. And I want to specifically talk about one type of uh, intrinsic inter interpretable model named NBeats. Uh, and this model is published by uh, Yoshio Bengio's group from Montreal 
And in this paper, they have one hypothesis that uh, they say the, mo the models can be more interpretable by adding some uh, encoding some inductive bias to the model architecture. And they can become more interpretable without, without sacrificing forecasting accuracy. Uh, this is also sometimes known as the accuracy interpretability trade-off. Uh, and then they argue that we don't have to sacrifice more, much on the accuracy to get an interpretable model. And uh, they propose an interpretable architecture, interpretable deep learning architecture for univariate forecasting. And uh, their uh, model outperformed the winner of the M4-5 competition in terms of uh, mean absolute percent error. And in this M M4 comp in M4 competition, there are, um, it's a like, famous competition in time series. There are more than 100,000 time series from various domains, such as finance, industry, uh, healthcare. And then uh, there are time series with different intervals, daily, weekly, monthly. Uh, and then the goal is to find uh, the best overall time series forecasting model. And uh, this model also influenced, uh, uses some meta-learning ideas. So it has uh, this block architecture with, uh, with fully connected layers. And it has, uh, then they have multiples of these blocks, which are called stacks. And then they have multiples of these stacks, um, which creates, which is the model. And they uh, sh show, they present two models, a generic model and then an interpretable version of that model. Uh, I will specifically talk about interpretable version. Uh, in that one interpretable model version, we have a trend model, a trend stack, and a seasonality stack. Uh, and then this is the this is how the model uh, looks. So we have these blocks with forecast and backcast, and then as I said, these blocks uh, create multiples of these blocks create stacks, and then multiples of these stacks uh, create the model. And in each block, there's a forecast and a backcast. Uh, and the, back, the backcast is uh, removed from the uh, input, and then the remaining part is provided to the next block. And in here, the uh, idea is that each block tries to solve some part of the problem and then it uh, it removes that from the input and uh, leaves the the rest uh, to the remaining blocks and in the interpretable architecture as i said they propose this uh, trend model and seasonality model and they they use a trend stack and a seasonality stack to achieve that and in those cases uh, when computing the uh, forecast and the backcast, uh, they use uh, they put some constraints. So for trend, uh, one imp one important property of trend is that it's a monotonic function. So that's why uh, we have some polynomials and we try to predict the coefficients of those polynomials. And for seasonality model. Uh, an important property of seasonality is again it's uh, cyclical, and that's why uh, they propose a Fourier series expansion, and then again they try to predict uh, the uh, the coefficients. And by doing that, uh, they can decompose uh, the prediction into trend and seasonality. And here are the results that they show on the paper. So here, the last three are the model's predictions. And they compare their results to uh, M4, M4 uh, competition win winning models and best, best statistical and pure machine learning models. So one, another interesting thing about this paper is in these competitions, most of the models uh, that are winning are the ones that apply heavy feature engineering. Uh, but in this case, uh, their model doesn't have any uh, feature engineering. They just apply uh, pure uh, deep learning. Uh, and the model, the mod their versions were able to, was able to outperform. 
And as you can see, they then combine the interpretable version and the generic version of the models, and they they uh, it performs the work even better. And I also want to talk about how the interpretability is how the interpretable results of the model. So here uh, on the left, you can see uh, the blue line is the actual uh, time series. And then the orange line and the green line are the forecast of the models. And the, these top two images, uh, stack 1G and stack 2G, shows uh, the forecast by uh, the generic stacks. Uh, in this case, uh, there is no inductive bias added to the, added to the model. So these stacks are not uh, interpretable. Whereas in the bottom version, we have the interpretable version of the model. And we have a trend stack and the seasonality stack. And then the sum of this course can correspond to the prediction. So by analyzing this trend and seasonality, we can, uh, we can have a better idea on how the uh, model is behaving, coming up with the prediction. Um, I also want to talk briefly about some other explainable AI methods. So there's uh, an interesting model named temporal fusion transformers. Uh, proposed by Google. And in this model, we can look at the model weights to identify significant regime changes or trend changes uh, in the data. Uh, they applied, they applied uh, this model to SMP 500 volatility data set. So on the bottom, you can see the full uh, time series. And then while the model is making uh, prediction for this time series, we can look at uh, the attention weights in different periods uh, to figure out these regime changes. So if there's no, uh, if there's low volatility, usually uh, there's low attention. The model uh, assigns low attention to those periods. Whereas if there's a significant regime change, trend change, the model uh, has usually sharp uh, in increase at increased attention on those areas. So by, by just analyzing these model weights, we can figure out important, uh, important areas in uh, these type of time series. And here I just want to share some different uh, explainable AI methods for models and methods for time series. Uh, if you're interested in this domain, uh, you can uh, have a look at these papers. And um, that's all from my end. Uh, if you have any questions, now I can take the questions. Okay, Ozan, thank you so much for that uh, uh, interesting presentation. I appreciate uh, all the work you put into this. Um, now, this is the audience portion of the questions, and we're going to go through uh, some questions that were submitted to us in advance, as well as questions being submitted through chat. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe the first uh, question here is uh, maybe one of the unique uh, challenges about time series is you're looking at a feature at a point in time, um, right? So you're not, I mean, a feature is uh, as of yesterday, as of the day before, et cetera. Um, I mean, when, you, uh, when you're looking in and doing uh, attribution methods, uh, it's your, your, are you randomly, or typically from the methods that you've seen, are you randomly picking the same feature at various points in time or different features at various points in time? Can you talk about selection techniques for, uh, some of the attribution methods uh, for selecting which feature to hide at which point in time? So to to find out the like variable importance? Yes. Think which features we should look at? Yeah, so uh, maybe can you talk about, so in a, uh, in a linear model, in a simple linear model, proximity to the decision boundary is, is, is fairly simple. Right, mm -hmm. but for a time series, that that prox uh, proximity is more complicated because your uh, the same feature could be important depending on when it happened. So, can you maybe help us understand some of the challenges uh, for selecting which feature uh, 
uh, too high to examine its importance for a time series prediction. Yeah, so I, I haven't seen a lot of work on uh, looking at those type of proximity. In SHAP, we consider all the combinations, uh, which is like quite expensive. So you like that, the, a type of uh, optimization can definitely be applied there. Uh, something specific to time series, but uh, I haven't seen a like specific feature selection method. So one, I think, important case here, as I mentioned, in uh, postdoc explanation methods, usually you have a train model, and then you have to perturb the input. Uh, so it's usually computationally a lot more expensive, especially if you have a lot of features. But in intrinsically interpretable models, uh, like the model can have some constraints. It can't be maybe trained for all data sets, but uh, the, the interpretability comes with the prediction. So uh, it's usually computationally much faster. OK. okay. Yeah. Now, now on, in terms of uh, uh, one of the challenges with intrinsically interpretable models is that once the interpretation goes beyond a certain number of features or a certain number of parameters, just gets too complicated for us to understand. So maybe can you comment on the interpretability budget? And when, when we're looking at an explanation, are there any guidelines or anything that you've seen that says, don't offer an explanation that's more complex than, 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 uh, than x number of features or uh, x number of parameters that you want to explain? Yeah, that's, that, that's, that's a good question. Um, so definitely, when you have a lot of input features, uh, mm -hmm. the explanation can get quite hard. So that's why uh, people try to, people are coming up with these time slices or different ways to combine the data and uh, come up predictions for uh, groups of, so instead of, for example, in those cases, usually uh, global explanations can be more useful than the local explanations in those, some cases, because when you have like 15 features, and then mm -hmm. if each of them has different effects on different time steps, it's it can be, the explanation can be uh, quite hard to interpret. So in these cases, you might wanna use a model that comes up with a global explanation, and then you wanna learn the importance of each uh, feature towards the prediction, and then maybe then you can just focus on those features, uh, you can train a local interpretive method just and then just look at the different effects of those uh, more important features instead of trying to understand all of them. And you know, you, you bring up a really good point here about the global versus local explanation. And, and in the context of, of time series, uh, it's would it would it would you say that it would it be safe to say that global explanations are more useful to some degree because it, it gives you the ability to look further back. I mean, you're, you're always looking about what happened in this instance in the context of the past. Mm -hmm. I, I would say that they are both useful because okay. um, global explanations give you an idea on how the model behaves in general for the whole data set. Uh, in some cases, for example, you can gain insight on uh, different uh, repeating patterns on the different time series patterns uh, repeating in the data set. Mm -hmm. But uh, local explanations are definitely very useful in some specific cases. For example, in healthcare, uh, in the example that I showed in how heart rate failure prediction, uh, you have a, each sample is a patient and then uh, you have some different events happening uh, that causes uh, heart heart failure. And then you want to understand, you don't want to understand uh, how each event is important by itself. You want to understand how those events are uh, affecting. So that's also important, but I think a more important thing is how different events con for this patient uh, contributing uh, to his heart failure, his or her heart failure. So local explanations can give us insights about these specific specific samples, and I think that's a lot. There's a lot of value in that uh, for a lot of uh, problems, uh, especially in healthcare. Okay, 
and I'm just looking at the chat. Okay, so so uh, for uh, maybe okay, let me maybe I'll ask this question then. Uh, for uh, post hoc explanations, uh, one of the challenges of interpretability is if the uh, you get a different uh, the instability of the explanation. You get mm -hmm. you run the post hoc method and you get different explanations uh, for the same instance that you're explaining, depending on uh, some some randomness uh, factors here. Uh, so could you comment on maybe the stability of post hoc explanations and the context of time series and uh, what have you seen and uh, what are your observations on on that that challenge uh, in, in that context? Yeah, def definitely. So one uh, issues for for stability. I think these like m methods like SHAP are mostly stable and mm -hmm. they have some properties that uh, make sure that when you train it for the same sample again you will get a, the same prediction and it doesn't have hyperparameters like the kernel width that uh, the line method has mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there's a more uh, subtle and unsolved problem and that's how we represent the remote features and uh, the absent features how we represent the missingness and depending on how we represent the missing features, the mm -hmm. predictions can change a lot. Uh, this is especially, the, the same thing happens for the is for images or other uh, tasks. So how we represent this missing features is quite important. Uh, for natural language processing, it's fairly easy. You can, uh, you can have a token if the word doesn't exist. But for image and um, time series domains, this is still a big problem. Uh, there is a great article about this that compares these different um, mis apps, different ways to represent remote features uh, for image in distal pop. Uh, it's about I think the article is named something about feature attribution, uh, but the we usually represent in time series remote features as with as i said noise we replace it with noise or mean values but this is not we don't know what's the best way to represent it and yeah that's that's still that, that's a stability issue uh, by by the way we can still evaluate uh, which type of uh, removal performs best so we can compare uh, we can come up with different explanations in one we can remove uh, we can replace the features with the mean in the other we can re replace the features with some noise and then we can evaluate which one performs better but that can also change the the, the best performing one can also change depending on the problem so we still don't have a clear way to uh, represent these missing features, but so that's one source of instability. Uh, but other than that, I think uh, most of the techniques are uh, stable if you're use if you're re represent the remote features in a specific way. Now, um, when you were represented, uh, when you in your slides, you showed the trend and seasonality expressed visually, right? There was a clear visual chart that showed the trend and, and seasonality. Are there any metrics that go along with that visual that help us uh, measure or identify there's a seasonality or, or a trend that uh, has been captured by the time series uh, model? So for end beats, uh, so I think those are the, so we, we basically, uh, divide our prediction into a trend and a seasonality, and mm -hmm. uh, that's that's how uh, some of the classical uh, time series prediction, statistical time series prediction techniques work. So Arima, for example, uses those type of uh, features. Uh, it has features that give you insights about trend and seasonality. So that's why NBs try to decompose the prediction like that. Um, so there is. I don't. Do the, I haven't seen any other way to uh, some like extra information that provided by the model. But another important thing here is, I think your model predictions uh, 
uh, your model explanation is as good as your uh, can be as good as your model performance, right? So if the model is not performing well, then the explanation uh, produced by the model is less meaningful. Uh, so that's why maybe like the model performance is one metric uh, okay. to understand how the model is, how the explanation, how uh, meaningful the explanation is. Okay, I am looking at, I'm getting a number of questions from the chat. Uh, the first question is, how many observations, uh, time series threads, do you need to train uh, your models with? That is the lower bound of uh, um, uh, basically the minimum requirements for training, if you will. Okay, so, for, for time series models in general? Uh, it looks like it's it's a, seems to be a very broad, yeah, broad. And yeah, it's, so can you talk about minimum requirements to train a time series model? Yeah, it's it's a very broad question. So yeah. it, it really depends on the hardness of the problem. The, uh, and also it depends on number of features. So if you have, mm -hmm. if you have like 100 features, then you can maybe like train a model with, and the problem is fairly easy, then you can maybe come up solve the problem with less number of features, like less number of training data observations, uh, and you can train a simpler model. But there's like one rule of thumb that I like to use for time series, mm -hmm. for, for deep learning in general. Uh, mm -hmm. Like for uh, every class that needs to be predicted, I think like having at least a thousand samples is like, something if you want to predict two classes have, having two two thousand samples is it like seems like a good uh base baseline uh but of course like that's some just something that i uh, use as a rule of thumb but there is no uh th there is no very clear explanation for that yeah. sure sure it's it's so the answer is it depends, and maybe yeah. kind of try a thousand per class, and uh, if you're <laughs> lucky, then you're good. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. So th the next question here is: Can you use these same methods for a Bayesian framework? Uh, and I'm assuming that these are interpretability methods. So uh, uh, yeah, maybe maybe uh, could use a little bit of help clarifying the question, but. It seems that the question is, could you use the same interpretability methods uh, for a Bayesian framework? Or uh, some of the maybe post hoc methods, uh, are they applicable to a Bayesian framework or are they model agnostic? And uh, they could potentially be used for Bayesian framework uh, type uh, models versus time series. Yeah, I'm... I'm not, uh, I haven't seen any examples. So okay. I don't think I can comment on that. No, no worries. I mean, uh, fair enough. So, I mean, if, if it's a uh, straight up uh, classification problem that is model agnostic, it really doesn't matter how you uh, came up with the prediction. It's simply doing an association between the uh, input features and the predicted class. So. In that context, possibly, but but certainly uh, that's a completely different, or or that's a completely different, but but somewhat different domain than the models predicting time series. Uh, why exchange removed features with mean as opposed to say median? So in the method of when you're selecting uh, your imputation method, if you will, uh, mm -hmm. for and when you remove the feature and replace it with mean, why did you choose mean versus median? Uh, so I, I, so I just, so that's what's been used in the literature. Uh, okay. I haven't choose uh, to use mean or the median. Um, so I, I haven't thought about using median, so I don't know how to compare those, but I can, what I can say is, uh, in, in the SHAP for time series paper, uh, where they applied mean and the uh, noise uh, for to represent to, for imputation, but they they tried global mean and local mean, 
And they argue that uh, the global mean is more useful because uh, the local mean, um, I think the local mean was creating uh, too much peaks and lows. Uh, mm -hmm. So they decided to, they decided that global mean performs better. But yep. I haven't uh, thought about using median. I mean, it, it's definitely something worth uh, trying. And uh, if it experimentally proves yeah. to give us better outcomes, then, then we'll yeah. use it. But it seems that other people tried that and ended up with uh, not necessarily uh, the best outcomes. Yeah, yeah. I, I definitely encourage people to try that out because mm -hmm. uh, the good thing is like we don't know what works best, but we can. Uh, we we don't know. There is no like best way, but we can test how they how how good each of them works. We can for uh, once the model comes up with an explanation, then uh, there are ways to evaluate uh, the quality of that explanation. One uh, popular method is called ablation, uh, K ablation. We can remove uh, the most significant uh, features from the model. Uh, provided by the explanation method, and then we can see how much the prediction changes, uh, how much the error increases, and based on that, we can understand the how good the explanation actually is. That that is a really great reference because I, I know it's it's one of the uh, underlying questions that a lot of people are talking about is how do you measure the quality of the an explanation, and, and that's that's a great reference to uh, to show a reasonable approach to measuring the quality of the explanation. Exactly. So I'm also working on, uh, in our lab, we are working on a similar type of thing. We propose the uh, evaluation method for uh, time series, local time series explanation methods. Uh, so that's like definitely something we can do. And when we have these uh, quality evaluation methods, then we can find the best way to represent the missing features and best way to exp represent missingness or the best explanation method for time series. OK. And uh, okay, so I think uh, let's see here. I'm getting a lot of uh, questions here. So just give me a second. In general, use the median. So there's a comment uh, about, in general, use median when there is a high uh, degree of uh, skewedness. The data is skewed. So that's, that's one uh, commentary. Uh, is the noise which is added to the mean a white noise, or is there a way to play around with the noise? So uh, this is uh, there's there's a strong interest in medium versus meaning, yeah. and <laughs> and the noise that is generated around uh, that. So uh, can you comment, or do you have any? So uh, I I remember that in the paper they were using white noise. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, just like Gaussian noise, but uh, yeah, they it they we can play with that, but I don't. So then there's too much instability, I guess. Like depending on your explanations will change also on how you tweak that noise, uh, and then your quality of the explanations changed based on that. So yeah, I'm that's something that yeah, that's Very, something you can experiment with. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely a very interesting uh, attempt uh, or very, a hyperparameter to tune or, or to experiment with different approaches and just experimentally try it and, and see uh, if you can get better results uh, in the Your sound cut off. Um, okay, looks like Ali is um, having some connection issues. Specific data oh, set, and, and I think that's your. Uh, can you can you hear me now? Yeah, now we can. Okay, no worries. Uh, I'm just. I think I was agreeing that it's definitely worth experimenting and uh, trying mean versus mean and just uh, evaluating the uh, impact of those experiments uh, for a specific 
data set and for a specific problem that you're working with and, and uh, report on those results. Interesting conversation. Uh, I, uh, before we wrap up, uh, are there any final thoughts that you would like to share with us? Um. I think I think that's it. So time explain the life for time series is a very interesting domain. Uh, and I'm also working on this domain on my PhD. Uh, if you're interested uh, in this area, uh, please like like you can have a look at the papers that I showed you. I, I think the slides will be shared uh, in under this video. So uh, have a look and uh, I hope you enjoyed the talk. <laughs> Okay, uh, I thank you, Ozan, for a great presentation and thank all of those who participated um, in the session with us through chat as well as uh, submitted questions uh, uh, earlier. Uh, to see more uh, free content uh, like this, visit our website at ai.science and log in to access slides from this and other presentations. Also, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, uh, ML Papers Explained to get notified about uh, all the live sessions and other free content that we publish. Uh, this concludes our event, uh, and thank you for watching.